student came to me once, this wasn't about abortion, but it was, uh, but it was after class, and he said, uh, he said to me, you know, Professor, in class today, you mentioned the moral law, um, but isn't morality just relative? Isn't morality just relative? Um, uh, some people might even say that murder is wrong. Okay, there was a time, once upon a time, when I would have responded to a young man like, the, like this by thinking, oh my gosh, this poor guy doesn't know murder is wrong. I'm going to have to pump that knowledge into his head. I'm going to have to convince him that murder is wrong. I'm going to have to teach him that murder is wrong. I'm going to have to somehow find considerations sufficient to persuade him of the wrong of murder. And that was exactly the wrong thing to do because you can't convince something of somebody, somebody of something that he already knows. I now realize people do know these things. So what I said to him was, um, are you really in any doubt about the wrong of murder? And he said, well, some people might say that it was all right. And I said, well, sure, but I'm not talking to some people. I'm talking to you. Are you at this moment in any real doubt that murder, the deliberate taking of innocent human life, is wrong for everyone? And he hemmed and he hawed a little bit, but then he, but then he admitted, well, no, I guess I'm not. Now, you always have to follow through here. You might think, well, gee, triumph. No, that's not a triumph yet. You have to follow through, follow through, follow through. So I said, well, then in that case, we don't need to waste time talking, because, talking about relativism, which you're not really in doubt about, as we now discover. Why don't you tell me something you really are in doubt about? Now, that was a sort of a moment of, of, uh, of transformation for him then. It was eye-opening. He had thought that he was in doubt about moral truth or relativism, and he really wasn't. All it took was just a question. Are you really in any doubt about that? No doubt he did have real doubts, but at least now we could talk about something that wasn't a waste of time. Here's another example. I call that, that first one turning back the question. The second one, this is dissipating smoke. Um, has this ever happened to you? You're having a discussion with somebody about some matter of moral truth, or maybe something else like the existence of God, and the person, um, the person has, uh, has, has many, many objections, and uh, you answer them, and you try to answer them. Well, in, it's happened to me in several conversations that I would try to do this, and the person would pepper me with objection after objection. Now, he would let me begin to answer each objection. But then just as I was about to get to the punchline of the response to the objection, uh, the person that I was speaking with would stop, interrupt me, and instead introduce a totally new objection from a totally different direction. So I said to, um, I said to, I said to, uh, to, to one person, have you noticed the, a pattern in our conversation? And he said, no, what? And I said, well, it's just that you have a lot of objections. And he said, well, yeah, sure I do. And I said, oh, that, yeah, I know, but that's not, that's not, I haven't got there yet. I said, I said, but have you noticed that every time I begin to tell you my answer to the objection, you interrupt just before I get to the punchline and, and give me another? And uh, this fellow said, um, yeah, I guess I am doing that. Why do you think I'm doing that? I said, well, I don't know. Why do you think you're doing it? And he said, I guess it must be because I don't want to hear the answers. I said, okay then. What this shows us, this is the follow through again. What this shows us is that the important thing for us to talk about isn't all of those objections. The important thing for us to talk about is why you don't want to hear the answers. Now you might think, well, that's not much. Gosh, you're only tell, telling us something, okay, you got him to see that he didn't want to hear the answers, but it isn't as though you've converted him, changed his mind about anything. Well, no, these are multi-encounter conversations. What you're trying to do is open a window that is shut. If you can get that window to open for only 15 seconds, 
Before, by cleverness, somebody closes it again, you have achieved something. And by cleverness, they will close it again. That's what a lot of modern college education is about. Not making people wise, but making them clever. So that when a window opens on truth, they can come up with clever arguments to shut it again. But if that window keeps opening, people begin to remember. It irritates them. That window was open for a couple of seconds. It did it again, and it gets under their skin, and they begin thinking about it. And so maybe in the next conversation, you can make a little more progress, or maybe not you, but somebody else. You have to look for those opportunities to get a little light. Mm -hmm.